All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, especially for the 50 odd of you uh, that showed up quite early. Uh, this is uh, my name is Ryan Nash. I'm the CEO at Gust. I'm joined today by Peter Swan, uh, who is our CEO. And we're pretty pumped. Uh, this is actually the most RSVP event we've done so far um, on one of the most complicated topics that we can try to talk about. So this is going to be a fun hour. Yeah, it's probably uh, one of the events that we have promised for the longest, too. So it's good to finally deliver on it. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you've come here from our other events or from an office hours where we said, uh, join that and we'll get into more details about it. Now is the time to get into details. Um, but we're going to try to break this down uh, to be understandable, show real examples with real math, but uh, also kind of couch it in hopefully an understandable history about convertible notes and safes and how they work. Um, uh, for anybody asking, we are recording this. Uh, anybody who's here or RSVP'd, it will automatically be sent to them about uh, two hours after it's done. Um, I'm going to run through the slide deck and do most of the explanation. Pete is going to correct me when I use the wrong terms and mess things up or talk too fast. Uh, he's also going to man the Q&A. Um, so there's a Q&A section. Unfortunately, with GoToWebinar, uh, you can't actually use the chat. Only we can use the chat. It's very unfair. We'll look into that later. But there's a Q&A section. So if you have any questions as you're going along, feel free to ask them in there. Uh, Pete will serve them up and stop me uh, if they're super relevant to where we're at. Uh, we'll also do some room for just open Q&A at the end of it. Um, and other than that, I, I think we're ready to go. Um, Pete, do you want to give a, just a quick intro on yourself and then we'll kick it off? Uh, I don't think we need an intro on me. I'm not all right. that excited. <laughs> go ahead. All right. Uh, so understanding convertibles, how to raise early money without giving away a huge chunk of your company or breaking your brain. Um, I have some cute animations here somewhere. If I click on the right thing, there we go. Uh, so let's run through, sorry, getting my stuff. So when people raise money, uh, we're gonna mostly talk about pre-seed money raises for startups. What exactly do they mean? There's a bunch of terminology out there. You'll hear people saying, I'm doing a bridge round, I'm raising a round, I'm doing a series A, a series seed, things all over the place. And there's not consistent use of the terminology. But to break it down fundamentally, when you're raising money for a private company, you're basically selling something to someone in exchange for something else, usually money. But what is the something that you're selling? Um, the most straightforward approach, and any of us who weren't you know, born into the startup world and just thought about like public companies is a chunk of a company, right? A share, a piece of ownership that will eventually appreciate and be worth a lot more than it is today. That is what an investor wants. That is why they give money to companies because they have some belief that it's gonna grow and at some day they'll be able to sell it um, and get a nice return on their investment. So clearly everybody's like, well, that's stock, right? Well, it used to be, but it's not exactly as much anymore, especially with high growth early stage companies. Um, we're, we're selling something slightly different um, when we talk about convertible instruments. And we're gonna, this whole talk is about what does that actually look like and how does it play out? So before we dig deep into the terms and the types of convertibles, we're gonna run through a bit of a private fundraising history and go into some details as to kind of how we got to where we are today and why we have things called safes and convertible notes. So the rough history uh, is previously, if you wanted to invest into a private company, we're talking decades and more ago, uh, what would happen is the company would create a new share, a new class of shares and sell it to the investors. And those shares would have a bunch of the extra special rights associated with them so that they could justify being sold at a higher price than usually the company, um, you know, the, the founders bought their shares for. So deals were done like that for, for a long time. Uh, around the early 2000s, something was created called convertible notes that started getting popularity. Uh, they were just faster and cheaper to execute than creating a whole new class of stock and doing all the negotiation around that. Uh, but they did have some you know, protections around them so investors could have some confidence that they weren't getting fleeced or that they would have no you know, mechanisms of protection or control in the future if the company was successful. Uh, go forward a decade and a half and all of a sudden YC, which is a notable uh, accelerator out in the Valley area, uh, you know, famous for accelerating a lot of the unicorns that are household names today, they introduced an even faster instrument called a safe. Um, it was basically just a promise for future equity when we'll figure it out later. It literally stands for simple agreement for future equity. Um, this was a lightweight agreement, often used mostly by YC companies, but it started to get popularity outside of YC. And then most recently in 2018, YC updated that safe to be what's called a post money safe, which introduced some additional investor protections called valuation cap or discount or both. 
as well as change the game a little bit in terms of how the uh, the clarity of the investor's you know future ownership would look. And we'll get into a deep dive there in the future. But that's our rough timeline. We're dealing with about two decades of activity in the modern world. But honestly, like convertible notes have existed since the 19th century or convertible debt. That was just a convenient instrument they used to sort of innovate in the funding space. But why would we need to innovate in the funding space at all? Why can't we just sell shares in our company for whatever price we agree upon and you know, be happy about that? Well, the thing is with preferred rounds, the math is easy, but the negotiation is hard. So in order to actually sell shares in a private company, the investors and the entrepreneurs need to agree how much the company is worth now, and then they have to agree on all the terms of that new share class. So most companies, you know, we're at Gust, we make uh, Gust Launch was a company as a service platform. So we incorporate companies, we run their cap tables, we structure all their legal agreements, you know, really nice and easy. Um, the vast majority of startups have like 10 million authorized shares. They issue shares to the founding team. Everybody owns what's called common stock, which is all at the same level. That's the founders, the early contributors and whatnot. When you do a preferred round, you create that new class of shares and it's it's better than common. It has preference. It has additional rights and there are a litany of rights uh, that you can put into a preferred share class like control negotiations, voting things, conversion ratios, drag along rights, tag along rights, all these things that need negotiation as to whether they're in or not in this preferred round of shares. And usually that means that there's lawyers on both sides. The founders are paying lawyers, the investors well, if the investors are paying lawyers, it might be paid by the founders. You have to negotiate all that stuff. And it takes a long time. On top of just negotiating the terms and what's fair, the company also undergoes due diligence, detailed due diligence, to ensure that the value is really there. If investors are going to fork over a good amount of money and say this company's worth $8 million, they want to see that all their agreements are signed, their cap table is set, they've gotten the appropriate agreements in place with their advisors, with their early employees, you know, that everything actually makes sense and there's a there there. They own all their IP. And that means lawyers going through documents, looking through drop boxes, all that stuff. So it takes a long time. The negotiation is complicated and usually it's just not worth it if you're only raising a small amount of money. You know, if you're going to spend tens, if not maybe low hundreds of thousands of dollars in like cleanup negotiation and diligence, you better be raising enough, much more than that. So it's worth it that you can actually deploy that money. But the final ownership is super clear. We're going to use the famous example company. A private company is raising $2 million and they can convince the investors that their company is at the moment worth $8 million. The end result is those investors own 20% of the company because it's a $10 million company after it receives a cash infusion of $2 million. And the common stock, which would be the founders and early contributors are left owning 80% of the company. Nice and clean, nobody's confused at ownership or control wise. So why is that? Before we move on, I think it's sure. important to point out that the, the biggest point of negotiation and the toughest thing to do for a preferred round at a very early stage of a high growth startup is just agreeing on the valuation because there's there's no revenue and there's very little to value. Exactly. Everything is uncertain. So a lot of times you're basically like, you know, putting your finger up in the air, like, what's this company worth? I don't know. We're an ad tech company in this space and this company is who knows, right? So if anybody's here has seen the interest in this space has really, really heated up over the last two decades. You know, in 2000, I don't even think Shark Tank was around. I'm not saying Shark Tank is a good example of startup investing, but it's gotten into the, the zeitgeist of people, right? So more and more deals are happening. Silicon Valley is now this gem of the West Coast and is you know, leading the world, their thought leaders, and all these things like that. But everybody's getting into startups for all good reasons. Lots of players. Deal velocity starts to become very frustrating, especially around the uncertainty. Investors are now investing in companies in such an early stage that there is no revenue to look at. There is no, the financial projections are a guess. You know, they've put their thought in them, but there's nothing to really show traction yet. But the investors still want to put money into these companies because they've seen the outsized success that can happen if you get in early. And they're largely betting on the founding team. They like you, they like your idea, and the market seems right. So can I just give you $25,000 and see what, and run with this? Can I give you $50,000 and we'll see later on? But it's not productive to talk about validation valuations because there really is nothing to go on. So how can we do this faster while not getting ourselves in trouble? Enter convertible instruments, a promise of future equity with controls to manage uncertainty. So rather than say, I'm going to spend all this time negotiating this stock based around evaluation, how about I just sell you a future agreement that says, hey, when we go and do that in the future and spend all the time and money and the legal fees to do that, you'll get a chunk of that. And not only will you get a chunk of it, but you'll get a little bit of a discount um, because you took a risk on me early. So convertible instruments, often safes and convertible notes are the most common ones. 
uh, there is security. So there is security you are selling to investors and you do need to register them with the SEC or file an exemption that says you don't need to register for them with the SEC, which we'll talk about in a whole different talk if you hang out with us. Um, but it is not a stock. It is a, an agreement for future stock. Um, now, just a straight up promise doesn't hold a ton of weight. It doesn't make investors uh, feel super comfortable. So convertible instruments have a bunch of investor protections that basically account for the future good scenarios and sometimes the future bad scenarios. So they, they feel comfortable that they're not going to get burned, or at least that they will take a reasonable amount of participation in the upside uh, if things go right. Um, so some of those protections you'll hear about are valuation caps, discounts, pro rata rights. We'll get into the details of how those work uh, later on in the talk. Um, another benefit to convertible uh, instruments is there is an incentive mechanism uh, and also a deadlock breaking mechanism. This was more popular in the, the early 2000s when you'd have a lot of investors kind of interested in the deal, um, but the founder didn't really have a lot of leverage to make one of them kind of fall over the line and say like, yeah, I'm in. So you could actually offer some preferential terms to some of the earliest investors and then later on use that kind of momentum to bring in other checks. Um, so I think I've said it uh, before, but we're going to use three terms that generally mean the same thing. A qualified financing, a priced round, and a preferred stock round are all basically the same thing. Preferred stock is the kind of stock. They call it a priced round because you have a price, the valuation of the company, and a qualified financing is basically what these convertible instruments uh, call one of those rounds. It's like qualified as something good, preferred, priced. Uh, cool. So two kinds of convertible instruments that are most popular, safes and convertible notes. Like I said, convertible notes were first. They were basically a riff on an existing debt instrument um, that does accumulate interest over time and has a payoff date. However, they did not use it. Investors don't use it the way that they would traditionally use debt. The, the interest rate is usually the bare bones that you can get away with like 5% or something like that, as minimal as possible. And the maturity date is there as an investor protection to have a conversation in the future, but no angel investor is really intending to collect the debt in a private company that basically has no assets. You know, by the time the maturity date comes, either the company is raising another round or they're probably going out of business. So there's not a lot of you know, payment expected to get out of it. But that's the instrument they had at the time. Um, so it's think of it less as debt and more of kind of like a promise, but with the, the maturity date being a sort of an accountability mechanism for the founding team towards its early investors rather than an actual like payoff. And these things don't happen automatically. So when the maturity date comes, the majority of the investors would need to vote together to say, hey, we want to pay this back or hey, we're just going to bump this out by another year, which is the most common uh, result from hitting the maturity date. Actually, honestly, the most common result is people ignore it for a couple months until somebody says, oh, we got to clean things up because we're going to do something else and then maybe finally get some people in order to do it. But pretend I didn't say that. <laughs> the controls on that, it can have a valuation cap, uh, it can have a discount, uh, and it often has a conversion trigger. This is another protection that says the company needs to raise above a certain amount of money before this convertible note will convert into preferred shares. And that's a protection so that the investors don't, like the founder can't basically do a sham round where they raise money at a super low valuation so that the investors convert and have very little equity. So convertible notes, tried and true in the market. There's been a ton of these over a while. Um, there's a lot more case law. Uh, on the books. So if you're outside of kind of the West Coast Valley, you, you might run into convertible notes a lot more, especially like middle American investors, you know, Ohio, Chicago, even in Austin, even East Coast is actually more popular. Um, and there is some more protections on exit events um, because a lot of times investors, there's lots of different kinds of investors out there. Some investors are basically, I only care if you're literally going to the moon, if you're a unicorn. I don't care about the down round. I don't care if you basically sell in a fire sale and I could get my money back with maybe 10K extra, like ah, I'm gonna ignore all that. But there's a ton of investors out there that have a very specific portfolio thesis and approach and they're very active angels and they write checks, but they're like, no, I have, this is my job. And like, I do need to recoup some of this investment. So like I invest with convertible notes because I'm more protected in the case of things not going well. Let's enter safes. My my analogy up here is the convertible note is the slightly older convertible with a lovely umbrella over its head because it has some additional protection. While the safes are the new sexy yellow convertible that goes very fast, but can fly off a cliff sometimes. Safes are not debt. It's just a promise. It's like a three or four page document that says, "Hey, when we go and raise more run funds, you're going to get uh you're going to get to participate in that with a discount." It's so no maturity date. The investors don't have any means to come knocking on your door to say, hey, what's been going on? I gave you 50 grand two years ago. Can also have a valuation cap and discount. 
there is no conversion trigger. It only converts on a qualified financing event. So there's not a lot of language in there to happen, you know, if down rounds or weird things happen in the future. Um, and it's not as tested in the court yet. They've only been around for, I don't know, less than a decade. So there's just not a lot of case law. Startups usually take five to seven years before they hit really, really big events that would go like a whole chain audit. Um, not saying that they're dangerous or risky. Uh, they've been used in probably hundreds, if not thousands of rounds by now. Um, but the, it'll vary which kind of investors kind of like either, if they're aware of them at all. So when it's actually time to convert at that funding round, convertible notes and safes actually operate pretty similarly. We create this new class of preferred shares. We create enough to accommodate both the convertibles and the new money investors. Um, the convertible investors get to purchase those shares just at a lower price than the new money coming in because they have that uh, incentive. And that lower price is usually determined by one of two things. And it's usually the better deal for the investor. It's either the valuation cap or the discount. The discount is the most straightforward. It's literally a percentage discount. So if you're raising money and the new money investors have figured out that the shares they're buying are worth a buck, anybody who's holding a safe or a convertible note that triggers the discount, they can buy them at 80 cents. So if they gave you 50 grand, um, they will have the buying power of something like $62,000 when it comes to your preferred runner, 62,500 cool incentive. If the cap is invoked, the convertible investors buy shares as if the valuation was at the cap's amount. So even if you're raising money and you've agreed with your new investors that your company is worth $8 million, but you have somebody who holds a, a convertible note or a safe with a cap of $3 million, they're going to buy shares as if your company was fundraising at $3 million, which means they're going to buy a lot more shares for that 50 grand that they gave you. Um, this is a protection for investors for when things go really, really well, because with something like a safe and convertible note, if you don't have a cap on it, the company raises some pre-seed money, and then they end up not raising in their first preferred round until they're exceptionally valuable. That $50,000, that risky capital that an investor gave the company, might buy very little shares in a really big company. So if your valuation is $30 million, you've 10x your company. Sorry, not 10x because you're not starting from a valuation, but you're raising 10x of the of uh, where you thought you were at. Um, those investors might feel a little burned because $50,000 just does not buy a lot of ownership in a $30 million company. So it's a cap protection. It's not an agreed upon valuation. I'm gonna take a beat there. Is there any questions or anything like that? <laughs> uh, we've gotten a couple. One is a little bit in depth, so I'm gonna save it to the end. So Samantha, we will get to that. Um, but I think you touched on an important point there that it's it's important to to push on a little bit. What investors are trying to do at this point and what you should be aware of is that they are trying to get an understanding and a window of how much of the company they will own at the preferred round because they are trying to understand that percentage so they can model their future upside. Excellent. Um, so knowing all that, how do we actually determine the preferred share cost? Um, Ooh, when we we got one that is relevant. Sorry. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Seems that negotiating a valuation cap isn't that dissimilar from negotiating a valuation. Agreed. Or it seems that way. And that is often the way that people naively approach it. I'm not saying naive in a bad way. Um, but if we go back to the preferred round, is if we could easily agree on a valuation of a company, why would we bother with all this discounting, this crazy math that we're going to get into? because it is a valuation cap, it is not a valuation. It is an upside protection for a great outcome for all parties involved, right? If the founder raises way above the valuation cap, we're rewarding those early investors for taking that early risk um, and protecting them from being co completely diluted. However, you're not putting the rigor into the valuation cap that you would put into the negotiation of a priced round valuation. So. My advice is to internalize this as a founder and really communicate the valuation cap as a protection mechanism in the case of really good things, not to say this is exactly worth, you know, we're roughly worth $3 million right now because we're super early. This could change based on the kind of market you're in, you know, B2C, B2B, you know, things like medical device companies tend to have, you know, far higher expenses, need to raise more money, you know, things that are just software based might be cheaper, like there's all sorts of ways to negotiate that but the cap is slightly different than agreed upon valuation and there's not as much rigor to it. And it should reflect that um, based on your negotiations with investors. Yeah, and I, I think again, the most intuitive way I've found to think about this is that a valuation cap is a protection for investors where they are trying to understand what percentage of the company they will own in the near future. And you should think about it that way as well, 
you know, how much money do I need to raise and how much, what percentage of my company am I willing to give up to get that money? Um, you can then use all the factors that would normally go into a, an actual hard valuation to negotiate where that cap lands and explain why you are right and you should only have to give up this percentage. But it's very much about determining the percentage at the next round, not really setting the valuation, um, although the two are, are close. Yep. Um, and hold on, I'm gonna run through to see if there's anything else. And we'll that double we down on have. that, uh, like yeah. how to approach the strategy of the funding round towards the end of the, the talk too. So if there's follow on questions around that, rest assured we'll get there. And yeah, Pablo, hopefully we have answered this, but the reason that you are setting the valuation cap is to understand, come to a, an understanding of um, in the ballpark, how much of your company you are selling for what amount of money and how much investors, what percentage of the company the investors will get in the future. And it's also worth highlighting that the, the interplay between the discount and the valuation cap allows for a flexibility in terms of the uncertainty of the future. So if you think of the valuation cap as a protection of tremendous upside, the discount is there that maybe things don't go, right? Maybe you sign, you know, things with a six million valuation cap and you need to do a preferred round way under, you know, six million. So you do a $3 million round, it's worth the time and money. Those investors still get uh, a discount, you know, for their early risk capital, but it's more reflective of the trajectory of the company and its capital as it's going forward. All right, we got questions pouring in now, so I'm going to try to go through a few of them quickly. Uh, rest assured that we are going to dive in deep and go through examples. Uh, so if I skip your question now, we will get back to it. Um, let's see. First one is from Sukendra Rompoli. In the same round, could you sign different terms, safe convertible note with different investors? For example, valuation of valuation cap of four million for one and five million for another. Yes, uh, you can mix instruments. It gets dicey. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, part of this later on. Uh, not all instruments have the right language in them to be aware of the other instruments that you're signing. So you could get yourself into basically legal complexity hell if you go cavalier and just sign whatever anybody will take. Uh, m for the most part, you're going to be fully transparent with new investors that you're going to bring in. So you're going to tell them all the things that you've already signed and the kind of investment you've taken. So if you're working with professional investors, it's much less likely that you're going to get a real convoluted pre-seed cap table. However, things are changing like crazy. You know, there's crowdfunding rounds, there's things like that. People are signing safes to unaccredited investors, which they probably shouldn't, but it's it can be simple for a company to get too many convertibles on their cap table and not have a clear visibility of what that's going to be like. On top of that, there's, there's two different pieces to this. The other this. one is the value, the terms. Yeah, yep. the terms and the instrument. Yeah. So Using different instruments is complicated. Complicated. Terms, Updating terms can actually nest nicely together. So both with safes with caps and discounts and notes, there is often a, a provision in them called the most favored nation provision, which allows you to sign instruments with worse terms in the future as the company is more validated. So say you bring in $100,000 with you know, a, a valuation cap of 3 million and a discount of 20%, eight months goes by and you need more capital, but it's still not ready for a preferred round. You could raise another 100,000, but then bump the cap up to 6 million. Cause you're like, hey, we got a product in market. We got initial traction. You know, we've de-risked this investment. You can't get the same terms as the guys that took such early risk nine months ago. So you, you could justify if we bump the cap up. Um, you can even bump the cap down if you can't convince anybody to put money into your company unless they have super good terms. But often what happens is most of these convertibles have that most favored nation clause that says, hey, if you go raise more money with better terms on convertibles, we get those better terms as well. So if you got investors in at 6 million because you were a great snake oil salesman early day one and then reality hit and you could only raise future at 3 million, those 6 million uh, cap holders would actually become 3 million cap holders for the most part. Check your documents. The standard ones usually have that, but not every single one does. That's more common with convertible notes. All right. Uh, how to evaluate my startup? We can follow up with some links on this. Um, there are some some different blog posts and things, but it's a combination of traction, team, previous experience, uh, fundraising, all of that stuff. But we'll follow up with details on that, Mohammed. Um, Kate, rule of thumb is that you will often sell between 10 and 20% of your company at each round. Uh, so that's a, a good set of guideposts. Um, you can get into more of the details and again, we'll send some follow-up um, information. Uh, Patrick, yes, you can have both a cap and a discount. 
Um, in YC world, it is becoming more common to have one or the other, uh, but you can have both. Uh, Steven, yes, SAFE is effectively kicking the can down the road on valuation, but giving early investors some compensation for the risk. That is exactly 100% nailing it. Um, let's see. All right, Nash, keep going. I'll try to wrangle the rest of these as yeah, we go. Hopefully we'll we'll get it in, in this well. I love, you, it's one slide changes the game in terms of Q&A, which is always fun. All right, so back where we were, we're saying, okay, so we have these, assuming we've had these convertibles on our cap table and these discounts, like how do we actually determine this preferred share cost? Um, and this is where things start to get confusing. So I'm gonna try to be pretty deliberate about my language because there's a lot of words that mean, the same words that mean different things in different contexts. So. Assuming no convertibles, before we had convertible instruments, when you raised money in a preferred round, there was two terms you hear a lot, the pre-money and the post-money valuation. Simply, the pre-money valuation meant how much your company was worth before the investment. The post-money valuation is after the money. How much is it worth after the investment? So nice and simply, an $8 million company agreed upon that raises $2 million is a $10 million company when it's all said and done. Eight plus two equals 10. Um, the share price is simply determined by that valuation divided by how many shares ha were created. It's not always like 10 million shares or anything like that. It could vary tremendously based on how much you gave the founding team and things like that. But the share count is very arbitrary. The value is what investors and founders are caring about and the, the ownership percentage. Once you introduce convertibles, um, you start to complicate things because they convert into pre preferred shares as well. But if you're creating shares to cover $2 million worth of funding, you're also creating additional shares to give to those convertible note holders or this, those safe holders. Like, when does that happen? Does that happen before the new money comes in? Does it happen after? Um, and that actually depends, and it's often a point of negotiation. And this is something that doesn't get talked about quite a bit um, because one, it doesn't happen to a lot of people, and two, it's very complicated um, and it gets very ambiguous. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna run through some detailed examples of what these rounds could actually look like and how conversion works and see some meaningful percentage differences and hopefully not confuse the hell out of everybody along the way. Um, so we're gonna use an example company. Uh, the numbers have been thrown out already. $2 million raised, 8 million pre-money valuation. This is a pretty heady raise, but I did it for the simplicity of the math. Like Pete said, you're usually giving away between 10 and 20% of your company at each round. You want to go to the smaller side of that as possible based on your needs. So 20% is kind of the max, and then we're gonna have some convertible stuff on top of it. Um, but it'll at least make the, the math a little easier. Um, we're not gonna mess with the option pool in this example, because we wanna focus on the effect of the convertibles. Um, so this company has an already set option pool that just doesn't expand. Uh, but there is some terms and we'll get into details about how the option pool can affect even convertibles. And we're gonna, we're gonna use three scenarios with the same amount of money, but slightly different terms on the convertibles. And we'll use safes for all these, but if you had convertible notes, it'd act pretty similarly. So our three scenarios is all $400,000 uncapped safe just with a discount, um, capped safe at a $3 million cap and a discount, both 20%. And then a capped post money safe 20% discount, and that caps at $3 million. So, before we dive into the, the scenario modeling of this and the, the details of the math, um, I do want to say we, I presented these in kind of the spectrum of founder flexibility or founder friendliness. So, an uncapped safe with a 20% discount basically gives you as the founding team a ton of flexibility with your future fundraising. If you have to raise more convertibles, you're fine. The caps don't interlace with anything. You don't have to think about that. If you go to a price round immediately, the discount kicks in. You're pretty comfortable with the 20% discount. You have a lot of flexibility. However, the founder, the investors don't have a ton of protection. They're basically saying, hey, I get a 20% discount if a preferred round ever happens, you know, but it could not happen for four years and it could be huge. And I guess I buy nothing. Woe is me. The capped safe with the same discount puts some additional investor protection in there, but uh, there's some flexibility for future convertible raise. Without it being a post money cap, the safes that if you raise more convertibles after that 400,000, those convertibles would actually kind of dilute each other a little bit. Um, and it wouldn't, there is a bit more flexibility for the company to continue to issue convertibles before going to a preferred round. So that's kind of a balance in terms of founder favorite, but still investor protection. The post money cap gives anti-dilution protection to those investors, which means that they are guaranteed a small sliver or a per certain percentage of the company based on the cap that you signed immediately prior to the funding round. And we'll get into details about that, but that is something that if you're cavalierly signing a bunch of post money safes, every time you sign one, 
you're basically fixing a certain percentage of your company immediately previous to the round that will never change. Um, and common will generally take the dilution from that. So it's a kind of a pendulum. All right, so before I jump into this, there's three methods to actually convert convertibles. Um, and what, the, what they are is basically the most investor friendly, the most founder friendly, and then something in the middle. What this argument is about is like I said on the previous slide, where do they convert into? Is it before or after the new money comes in? So the first one is considered before, and they often call that the percent ownership method. This is where the term pre-money starts to get confusing. Another way of saying this is that the convertibles convert into the pre-money valuation of the company, which means that the new investors are considering that the shares created for those convertible note holders are created and sold before their money comes in. Therefore, the post-money valuation of the company is fixed. This is going to be a $10 million company when this round is over, and we as investors are going to own 20% of it. You deal with <laughs> where the convertibles are you know, coming from. And that means that the, the convertible uh, ownership is going to dilute the, the founder shares. They effectively lower the pre-money valuation of the company. So while the new investors agree that the company is worth $8 million, that assumes that a chunk of it is already owned by these convertible note investors. So those new money investors, they get exactly the ownership they, that the post money and the money in is. So in this case, $2 million, $8 million pre, they're going to own 20% of the company. The founder and the other common shareholders are going to take all the dilution for the convertible. So both the money that was put in as well as the discount that they provide. This is called the percent ownership method. So we'll actually show you an example of this. Blow this up a little bit. Did that screen switch all right? Can you read that, Pete? Give me a... Cool. Um, so this is Gust Equity Management, our um, modeling and cap table thing. If you've heard of Gust Launch or your Gust Launch customer, Gust Equity Management is like underneath Gust Launch. And Gust Launch is kind of a set of guardrails and best practices built on top of a pretty strong uh, cap table management product. So this is my simple company. It has a common stock class of about 6 million shares. Like I said, it has an equity incentive um, plan, but we're not going to expand that during this funding round. And then I put two different kinds of convertibles, a pre-seed safe, which is just a fixed um, safe to good old Bruce Dickinson, no cap, just a 20% discount. And first we're going to play with that for these three scenarios, and then we'll get into how valuation caps work. So we have what's called round modeling here. This allows you to sort of simulate what happens if you raise money at a certain rate. So here, like I said in the example, we're going to say this company is an 8 million pre-money valuation, a 2 million investment amount. We're not going to expand the option pool. Um, and we'll see what happens. So before we even touch the convertible notes, we can see kind of what I was talking about in the slides happens exactly. This is what the company looks like before new investors come in. The founders basically own 87% of the company, and about 12% of it is reserved or already issued in an option plan. Uh, new money comes in, and that money buys exactly 20% of the company. So we just figure out how many shares we need to generate uh, to sell to the investors so that they can have 20% of the company. The end of the company is worth $10 million. New investors own 20%. The founders got diluted down to just about 70% of the company. Like I said, that's significant dilution for a seed round, um, you probably wouldn't have this option pool created beforehand or whatnot, but let's play with the numbers relative to where they are rather than being like, don't shoot for this. Uh, so let's see what happens when we convert the discount only safe. So there's no valuation caps involved and we're gonna convert it with the percent ownership method. So like I said, another name for the percent ownership method is that the convertibles are converting into the pre-money valuation of the company. That is the investors are insisting that they're gonna own 20% when they're done and the post money doesn't change. So you can see the initial ownership doesn't change, but we have this new stage called after note conversion. And you'll see this is the before. Now this all happens technically simultaneously in a big deal, you know, done with spreadsheets and lawyers and things like that. Oh, a little less lawyer. Oh yeah, definitely lawyers. It's Bryce Trump. Um, but before the new money comes in, we, we determine, hey, these pre-seed safe holders, we're going to have to generate just about 5,000 shares and they're going to get 6.25% of the company. And then the new money is going to come in and you can see they're owning a lot more shares than they previously did, but they still have 20% of the company. And then that immediately dilutes those convertible holders down to 5%. So at the end of it, the post money valuation is still 10 million. It's fixed. Um, the new series investors guarantee their ownership. The convertibles got their ownership, but now the founders are down almost five points or five percentages because they had to take the the burden of that the pre-seed convertible on their share class rather than the founders uh, the new investors coming in. 
We with me? That makes sense. I see you're you're answering things uh, on the Q and A through text. Yeah. Anything to float through. In? Nothing new. Uh, nothing new that we need to hit yet. Cool. All right. So that's one method, and that is the most investor or new money friendly method. They guarantee what they get, um, and you'll also see that actually gives the the convertible holders uh, an advantage too. All right. So now extra confusing. There's another method called the pre money method, where the convertibles convert into the post money. Why would they do this to us? It does make sense with the idea is that the pre-money valuation of the company is fixed. Everybody agrees that the company's worth $8 million. And now we treat that convertible money as if it's coming in alongside the new money with the new investors. So we're not raising $2 million. We're actually raising $2.4 million plus the incentive that we gave, that discount that we gave those founders. So this is best for the founder. So we create additional shares. We lower the post-money valuation. Um, or I'm sorry, we raised the post money valuation because we're saying, hey, we're raising 2 million. It's an 8 million company that's not changing. And there's some additional money that we raised from convertibles. So we're going to be above 10 million when we're all said and done. That means the new money investors actually take a little bit of dilution. They're not getting a fixed 20% of the company. They're going to have to take a little bit of dilution based on the convertibles plus the additional shares created for the discount. This means the founder, the common stockholders, they actually share in the dilution with the new money and the convertibles, which is good. We call that the pre-money method. Um, and I can go through a more detailed example. So to leverage the pre-money, we convert the notes into the post-money. Clear as mud. Initial ownership, again, doesn't change. But after the note conversion, you'll see that the pre-seed safe holders are actually holding less of the company than they did uh, during the percent ownership method. And then when the money comes in, the post-money valuation is bumped up uh, by half a million dollars. And what's interesting here is it's not 10.4, it's 10.5 because the discount also gets added to that post money valuation. There's a 20% discount. That's the incentive that they got for giving the 400,000 earlier. So you'll see the new series investors are actually walking away with a percentage point less. They have about 19% of the company. The convertible note holders actually hold less than they did in the previous thing, but they're still right around 5%. And the founding team has a lot less dilution. We can even see this if we just click quick. They're at 66.5. If we had switched it, they would have been at 65.5. So a whole percentage point comes out of mostly the new series and a little bit of the, the convertibles and goes back into the hands of the founders. So that seems like a great situation to the founders. If you can convince them to do that, great. Why not both? There's a third method. So in the negotiations, uh, you know, you can kind of split the difference and it's a compromise. Basically what they say is the post money valuation is fixed, but it includes the convertibles but only at the basically the base price or with only the money they put in, the discount is gonna go onto the founder's dilution. So now the post money valuation of the company is how much we agreed it was worth, plus the new money coming in, plus the original ticket price for those convertibles, in this case, 400,000. So founders get credit for that as if the money's coming in at the priced round. However, they're gonna take the dilution on the additional discount um, that they offered those investors. So they'll get diluted by that remaining $100,000, 20% discount on that money. Um, and so this is the idea is balanced. We're like, hey, all the money's coming in. We agree. You gave these guys a discount. That was on you. Uh, you deferred that, so you take that. We don't have a, a fancy uh, uh, chart for this, but basically what you'd find out is the new money investors wouldn't, wouldn't have 20%. They'd have slightly less, probably not 19%, probably like 19.5, 19.6. And the convertibles would also be between those two extremes, where previously they were owning as low as 4.7, or as much as five, they'd probably be five, eight, five, something like that. Cool. So those are the three methods. Um, just using discounts at the moment to see how significant the discounts were. Uh, next, we're going to get into valuation caps, but I'll pause there in case there's any relevant questions on the convertible methods at the preferred round. And yes, for anybody asking, we will share this deck. We'll share some follow-on materials. A recording will be sent. And we'll also send you guys some links to the free tools that we have and the paid for tools that we have that help you, one, not have to hold this all in your head all the time, and two, hopefully set you up so that you uh, are pretty aware <laughs> of what you're getting into while you're uh, you know, going down this fundraising journey. Uh, anything targeted I can answer, or should I jump into valuation caps? 
Um, okay. Let's keep going because we're already at 140, and we want to leave some time to circle back to some of this stuff. Great. All right, so let's get into valuation caps, the hot, hot goss of the, the day. So this was a, an investor protection that's always been in convertible notes and recently introduced in safes. If the preferred round exceeds the cap, the convertibles convert as if the preferred round was at their cap. So even if I'm raising $100 million, the investor that gave me money way before converts as if I was raising three or whatever the cap is. Um, in order to do this, they define this interstitial company capitalization at a time immediately prior to the, the preferred round. They use that to calculate their share price, which will be very different from the preferred round share prices um, and the totals for all the convertibles. How that company capitalization is set can have dramatic effects on the round and who gets diluted. Once you do all that, you calculate all that thing for the convertibles, you still then go through all the craziness we just went through for the preferred round to figuring out, you know, it doesn't go into the post money, the pre money is it somewhere in between. So generally, um, this company capitalization includes all the common stock that was issued. So the founding team, early, you know, contributors, or even promises, you know, if you put a promise with somebody that, oh, we'll grant you stock, you know, it'll usually happen before. Any warrants, which are, you know, usually like claims on common stock, uh, issued options, and the unissued option pool, um, if it's already allocated, would kind of be considered, this is the company's capitalization. Depending on the instrument, and this is, we'll get into specifics with post-money safes and pre-money safes, it might include the expansion of the option pool or not if it's expanding during um, the priced round. So let's go back over here and we will see a dramatic difference. So I'm gonna undo this pre-seed safe with no cap and instead we'll do the YC pre-seed safe. This one has a $3 million cap. Um, so I'm just gonna use the percent ownership method where we're converting the pre-money um, as it, but what you will see is the note conversion is dramatically different. So we're no longer just giving somebody a 20% discount, which was lowering the pre-money valuation by $500,000. Now we're capped at a $3 million valuation cap on this safe, so it's lowering the pre-money valuation by over a million dollars. So the pre-seed convertible investors are getting almost twice as much ownership as they were in the discount uh, scenario. And then when the new money investors come in, since we're using the percent ownership method, the post money is fixed, they own 20%. They dilute these guys slightly down to 9%, but it's still significantly higher using the cap than it would be using the discount. Likewise, if we do use the uh, dollars invested method, you will see the company's valuation grows by that amount. The new series gets diluted quite a bit um, and those safe holders are sitting at uh, a substantial 9% ownership. So that's basic caps. That's what we generally call a pre-money cap, um, as in the pre-money has nothing to do with the preferred rounds conversion, but rather the companies that capitalization does not include the safes that are converting. Uh, it just includes the common outstanding and options if they're there. So the last step of making it more confusing, thanks to YC in, in 2018, is they changed the terms of the safe and they explicitly called it the post-money safe. Um, and I probably should have said this a couple slides back, but you, this is the first time you actually see the term post money in a safe document. It literally is right at the top that says post money valuation cap safe. If you go look at the previous safes, even the ones that had the cap that were available for a little bit, they never said pre money on them at all. It's a retronym, I suppose, to call them pre money safes because once they changed it to post money safe, we needed a word to refer to the previous safe. So we call them pre money safes. But those pre and post money words do not have anything to do with the pre and post money valuation of the price round. They're specific to that company capitalization conversion event that's happening in order to calculate their share price separate from the price round. So, um, like I said here, uh, they YC introduced a cap to safes in 2018 and it was briefly available without the company capitalization, including all outstanding convertibles, but that's what the post money safe did. So now it's saying, hey, all the common stock, any of the options, this safe and all other convertibles is included in the company capitalization. That means that there's dilution protection for those convertible note hold, or for those safe holders um, because any other safe you sign is going to be included in the capitalization. So they're going to guarantee and lock in that immediate percentage ownership um, before the, the, the priced round. So what does that mean in actuality? If you sign a safe for a certain amount of money and it's a post money safe with a certain valuation cap, you can basically divide that amount of money by the cap and say, I have given away that percent of my company immediately prior to that preferred round. So in this example, 100,000 at a 1 million valuation cap, that's 10% of my company. 
and that was on this screen right here, right after the note conversion, you'd be basically fixing this to 10% uh, right before this new money comes in, regardless of the method that you choose uh, to do the price round with. Oop, sorry. Um, what's interesting is they even protect themselves from other convertibles. So if you sign a post money safe and then later you sign a convertible note because some investor insists on it, that post, that convertible note will not affect that post money safe. Um, and the biggest takeaway is a post money YC safe and a pre money YC safe with exact same cap do not convert to the same level of ownership. In the example that we're using with this $400,000, this $10 million company, a post money safe would have 10.6% 10 of the company when all is said and done, while a pre money would only have 9.42. While it's a single percent, imagine the scale because some people are raising millions of dollars on safes now before they ever hit their price round, two, three, four million, and that scaler is going to keep going up. Um, and what happens is the founder common stock is going to take that dilution. So do not be kind of cavalier about pre-money, post-money safe valuation. We're all at the valuation. Another reason not to think of this as the valuation of your company, but rather the valuation cap of the instrument thought of in holistic framing with the, the rest of the terms in that instrument. Um, we actually don't have a click-through post-money safe uh, conversion at the moment, but I simulated one by setting the valuation cap appropriately. Again, this is using the percentage ownership method, which is the, the new money investor friendly one that you can see here. Like I said, this YC safe with a post-money cap would end up with the biggest overall ownership at more than 10.5% um, because of that post-money company capitalization definition. Um, so to the previous question, we got a little bit more mixing instruments. You can see all these terms, like a post money safe protects itself, a convertible note could protect itself just as much depending on how it defines company capitalization. You could sign an uncapped safe that has no bearing on a later cap safe that you sign. The more you mix that, the more headaches you're gonna introduce for yourself, possibly your paralegals and lawyers when you're doing that. Um, and sometimes the math can even get crazily circular <laughs> because one says it includes all others while one says it doesn't. Spreadsheets can get fun. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing and you sign these, you know, kind of uh, one off and not really dig deep, you can just, worst case scenario, you're spending ten thousand dollars on lawyers to figure it out for you at the funding round. Or best case, worst case, you're taking a way more dilution than you expected. And it could also complicate fundraising efforts too, because uh, if you bring in non-sophisticated investors who don't really understand how these things work together and they kind of sign whatever instruments, whether they're getting a good deal or not. And then later you approach a more professional, sophisticated investor, they could understand what's been done and they one could use that as leverage to insist that they get the same or better terms or two kind of complicate the investor relationships uh, based on what you're trying to sell. All right, Nash, I'm gonna give you a one minute warning. So we've got uh, some good. time We're at the end. question. So this is basically the end. Um, the, the biggest takeaway is don't move too fast and break your cap table. Um, I know in the desert, you know, any water to drink is water you're probably gonna drink. So sometimes if an investor insists, post money, I want this, I'll do nothing else. This is how I do all my investments. You might not have the leverage to change the virtue of the instrument, but you might have the leverage to change the cap. Add a half a million to it or more, demonstrate your knowledge of it, what you're getting away and what you're trying to communicate to the investor, use it as part of your fundraising strategy to say, this is how much money we need, this is how we'll grow the team, this is why I think we should put a cap X amount higher, uh, and just be strategic. You know, If you can optimize for flexibility, put the least amount of you know gotchas in your early fundraising documents. If you can sign uncapped safes with a discount and figure it out and treat your investors good later and they're down with it, they trust you, you're gonna save yourselves a ton of headache. Know that not all valuation caps are treated equally. Look at that company capitalization, ensure you understand how it is, um, and be ready for that. The investors that you don't know yet might have drastically different preferences and or forcing factors in terms of the kinds of notes they might want to use. Um, and last thing, and this would be a whole different talk, <laughs> Uh, if you are creating a new or expanding your option pool uh, in this thing, there are some also terms in the post money and pre money safes that account for that or not in the dilution thing. So the biggest takeaway is do not just peg your option plan at 15% or 20% because you heard it was a good idea somewhere because they said it's the most common. You're going to be taking that dilution. Be deliberate about what you set your option plan to and only expand it if you need to. You know, if you say like, hey, this is our hiring plans. Don't get a 10% option pool just because it's a round number. Say we only need 8% because we only need to hire these people over this period of time. You can always extend it, but that dilution is almost always going to come out of the founder stock, not any of your future investors. And if this seems overwhelming, like there's a lot to keep track of, it's true. Uh, this is what we do. We built a platform that hopefully helps automate the vast majority of this. If you're thinking about starting a company, you don't have one yet. We take care 
like convertible notes are one tiny area, convertible instruments of the whole journey. Uh, each part of the journey has some level of complication, not all this complicated, but even from stock grants and NDAs and agreements, we help with that. We literally guide you through setting up a Delaware C Corp and getting all your stuff in order. Um, it's a cool platform. You get to hang out with Pete and I and the great team. Uh, it's awesome. Gus Launch solves a lot of the problems if you're just starting out. If not, if you're already started and you're kind of already in the woods of this, we do have free tools. Uh, we'll send out the resources to it to help you manage your equity and get, your, get a handle on this. Um, and yeah, and we're humans like us, where we do events like this to dry out my mouth and hopefully not overly confuse people. All right, in the questions, we'll try to get through as many as possible. Hopefully I already hit some. Um, Samantha asked uh, what the best mechanism for pre-seed investment is and whether pre-seed investment generally increases valuation. Um, Nash, I'll take this since you probably have a very dry yeah. mouth. Um, it's a hard question to answer, but I can give you a, an overview of what we put together with Gus Launch. Um, what we have done for pre-seed kind of friends and family is that we have an instrument that is a 20% discount um, with no valuation cap that is designed to roll up and kind of inherit the valuation cap of the next round. So we say, don't even worry about a valuation cap at this point. Lock in a discount so that there's some protection, but likely your earliest investors are not even sophisticated enough to have the valuation cap conversation um, if this is friends and family and they're just trying to get in. And then if you do negotiate around with a valuation cap after that with more professional investors, we take those folks, we transform them into investors in the follow-on instrument. They get the valuation cap, they get the protections that the future investors get you get one convertible instrument on your cap table and you go forward. Um, but the best way to think about it is don't set terms that you, your company, and your investors aren't prepared to negotiate yet because you don't have enough information or enough expertise. Um, and yes, pre-seed investment generally does increase valuation. Um, there are, well, there are different meanings to the word valuation, right? There's the valuation of your common shares for continuing to issue. Uh, there's the valuation of your company for future investment and things like that. Anytime you're building value um, in the company, including cash in the bank, that may affect the valuation. Um, typically, very early on, you know, internally, the company is deciding those things or through negotiation with investors. As you get later stage or adopt an option plan, then some other uh, valuations, external valuations of your company in various ways come into play. Um, Patrick, you can have a cap um, and a discount, but that is YC actually removed that template from their site over the course of the past year and now just offer one or the other. Um, I would say general rule of thumb earlier on, you're likely to see a discount as you get more and more sophisticated investors or more and more company signal, you're more likely to see a valuation cap. Yeah, that removal was just this, this last October, and it coincided with that um, other move about them reserving the pro rata rights. So uh, I, don't, I don't even want to get into that. Sorry. <laughs> um, Justin asked, will certain investors not get involved if the founder doesn't want a cap? It's really hard to, to answer. I will say that predominantly, if you're in a larger startup ecosystem that has adopted the safe, um, you know, your seed stage investment or even pre-seed with semi-sophisticated investors is probably going to involve a cap. Yeah, I would say a lot of this comes down to uh, relationship management as well. Um, so the documents that you sign, if, if you have like a good narrative and good relationship with your investors, um, you're not like handcuffed to things, right? So if, if somebody trusts you and your team and is like wants to get money in to get you off the ground and, you know, see what happens in three months, um, and you sign a safe without a cap and just a discount, and then later you get some feelings, some traction, some something's going somewhere, you can renegotiate. It does cost money, so it's it's worth doing being a little proactive up front because you need custom legal work to say, hey, that safe I signed, we're basically gonna annul that and replace it with a thing with the valuation cap, treat everybody nice. But like do right by your investors, do right by your relationships. Um, but the more investors you get on the tap cap table, the less likely you're gonna have. Um, those higher touch relationships. So you, you wanna put more rigor into the negotiation. Uh, Charles asks, are there affordable lawyers that can advise on this as well as stuff like shareholder agreements? Um, there absolutely are. If you are a Gus Launch customer, um, we will help with some of this. And we also keep a network of startup lawyers 
um, where we have negotiated uh, with them to have them waive their general retainer and provide one hour of billable service per month uh, for free. Uh, that is once you start accumulating billable hours. Um, if you are not a Gus Launch customer, uh, yes, there are startup lawyers who understand how to work with startups and will work with you on billing arrangements. Um, but it's important to remember that when you're in startup mode, uh, as soon as you're asking somebody to help you and you don't have money to pay them yet, you are pitching them much like you are pitching an investor. So your ability to access those things may be gated through the traditional startup gatekeepers, like your ability to pitch a warm intro and things like that. Uh, we are trying to break that down, but it is an ongoing process. Um, let's see. When is convertible notes for dummies? Um, yes, Jennifer, there's a lot here. Um, we are we are actively trying to figure out a, an easier and quicker way to present this and also build product around it. So we will keep you updated. And let's see. Do convertible investors have any say in how they convert? This was asked by Alex. Um, the convertible note itself will stipulate how the note converts. The price per share that the note converts against will largely be negotiated by the company and the preferred investors. Uh, sometimes the convertible note investors may also be leading that next round. Um, so in that case, they might have uh, some negotiation in, um, in the share price negotiation of the preferred round, which will implicitly um, inform the convertible note conversion. Yeah, professional investors generally <clears throat> they put aside money to follow on and to kind of top up their uh, contribution to a company that's seemingly being successful. So if you got a lead angel in there at a convertible note, they're more than likely to be participating in your seed round. Now, sometimes they don't have the, the pockets to handle that as it goes up into like a series B or a series C. So they'll just stick with their ownership or even get bought out in some cases. Um, but yeah, when I'm talking about new money and note holders, the presentation kind of makes them very separate audiences, but often they can be a little bit blurred. And there are, uh, there's pro rata agreements uh, for the YC safe. There's a pro rata side letter and it's common to see in convertible notes too, where an investor says, hey, I'm giving you a note, but I also want the right to basically top up in the next preferred round and buy additional shares. I'm not gonna get just what I converted, but that will require them to pony up additional money as well. But that means they'll be in the negotiation room too. All right, we got three minutes left and lots of questions, so we are into lightning round. Lightning um, if round. If we don't get to your question, we will do our best to follow follow up with uh, some show notes here, um, and feel free to reach out to us um, from gus.com if you have additional questions. Uh, Gil Travis at Travis asks about different tools in this area. Uh, there's us, Gus Launch. Um, we feel like we offer a pretty full featured solution back with human support, which is great. You get a cap table, early legal. Um, and formation. There are also tools like Stripe Atlas, which is primarily an incorporation tool. Um, there are tools like Shoebox. There is Cardo, which is primarily a cap table tool, not an incorporation formation tool. Um, there are a whole bunch out there. Um, we'll include some of them in follow-up notes, but if you have any questions, you can always book a demo and we'll walk you through exactly what we do. Um, Logan asks, are both the founder equity and employee equity pool diluted with each round of fundraising? Uh, yes, generally all shareholders are diluted by future rounds of fundraising. Uh, some of them may be able to maintain their percentage ownership through things like pro rata rights. Uh, James, yeah, we'll add links to paperwork and things like that in the follow-ups. Uh, Ryan, um, there are stipulations about how a safe will convert if the next event is an acquisition, um, but generally the safe is is meant to still do a, a similar thing, um, provide for a, an exit outcome for investors with some benefit from their early risk. All right. Sorry, flipping through all these now. I'm text answering some that I can as well. All right. All right, where do ESOPs usually come from? Uh, ESOPs are equity incentive plans or employee stock option plans. Those are predominantly carved out of the common stock. Um, so when you 
issue a new series of preferred stock in conjunction with a round, you and the investors will agree on the resulting size of the option pool. Um, that will be based on the common stock usually. Um, and while you are going back to the state to restate your certificate of incorporation to include the new shares, you can also expand the number of common shares available. Um, right. Um, if a company fails, largely these instruments are structured so that there is not an expectation of payout for the investor. Um, there are some provisions um, that may allow them to get paid um, in certain scenarios, but largely the expectation is that these will be a good thing or a zero. Uh, Pablo, you always need lawyers when you're using one of these or any of these because they are securities and you want to navigate securities filings and exemptions properly. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, you can contact uh, customer support if you're a launch customer to find startup lawyers and navigate that. Um, also to access the, the cap table modeling stuff that we've talked about today. And Francisco, as long as you want to form a US-based Delaware C-Corp, which is typically a good idea if you are going to raise money from US investors or um, go to market in the US, those are two cases where it might be a good idea. Um, we can support foreign residing founders, no problem. Chris, convertible notes can be paid back prior to conversion, um, but there are there are certain stipulations and agreements that have to be in place in order for that to happen. Um, and generally, yes, everything is a negotiation, and you can you can buy people out, but it will always come with the consent of the the investors who invested through those instruments, um, and there are. Since that is not their intended outcome, they want to be along for the ride and the upside. Um, likely that will come, you know, if you're trying to buy out safe investors, you're going to have to negotiate it and you're probably going to have to pay them more than what they originally invested. That is high level generality, uh, case by case basis, because that's just not what the instruments are designed to do. Uh, Simon asks, oh, we are two minutes over. Well, I guess we go a little longer. Go. We got 130 people left. Okay. Is it common to only have a common stock structure and no preferred shares? Um, it is not common, I would say. <laughs> in, in the early stages of the company, typically you'll start with just common shares, and that's how you will compensate or incentivize founders and um, you know early employees, advisors, and things like that. Typically, the preferred shares are created in conjunction with a future financing event. If it turns out you never need future financing, um, then it is possible. But again, that is not what these instruments are designed for. Um, it's not the path that these instruments are designed for. There are some newer instruments like uh, the SEAL, which is designed to also allow a convertible investor to convert to like a revenue share. Um, well, not exactly a revenue share, but convert to basically getting paid um, over time if the company doesn't continue on a VC trajectory. Um, but those are relatively novel things that are popping up and not standard to these types of things yet. All right. Okay, I think we got most of them. Uh, Charles asked about SEC filing with or without exemption, if there's tax implications. Uh, it's not necessarily tax implications, but rather, so the SEC basically says, if you sell securities to investors, you need to register them by default. Registering a security is basically IPOing your company. It's incredibly expensive. It takes a long time. You need a lot of people involved to audit everything. So the SEC makes a bunch of exemptions available to say, hey, you can sell securities in private companies as long as it falls under a particular exemption. And those exemptions are usually accredited investors only, you know, whether or not you can advertise the rounds so much. And if you're raising from unaccredited, you're working with, you know, somebody that can help you make sure you obey some additional laws and do the right things. 
Um, so it's less about tax implications for you, the company, but more about making sure you have a safe harbor um, so that you appropriately sell securities under the right exemption so you don't get in trouble with the SEC at some future date. Um, there are tax implications possibly for investors, depending on the states they're in and various things like that. The exemption filing will help get into them um, depending on the kinds of investors you're working with. Yeah, the states or countries that they reside or in. Or countries, yeah, yeah, because you can do international too. Okay. I think we've got questions. most of them. Oh, okay. Did you just well, find the scroll reel? <laughs> no, I've had to find it quite a bit. All right, I'll, we'll do one more. Um, Yi is asking, what about voting rights? What happens when founders go below 50% ownership? Um, your shareholders sit at the top of your, your company governance stack. So in a high growth startup, it is, it is expected that founders will not necessarily be majority shareholders um, at the time that the company is acquired or goes public. Um, in fact, I, I would venture to say that generally it is rare that they maintain a, um, a controlling stake. Um, but they are generally still relatively significant shareholders, so they will vote with everybody else and influence things. They will typically retain a board seat um, along with some of their investors, so they will still be involved in governance, um, but likely just in terms of share count, um, they will not maintain a, a controlling shareholding in the company. Um, now, if you are really executing incredibly, at each round, you do have the ability, if investors are breaking down your door, to try to negotiate in some, some preferential treatment for you or some ways to preserve um, you know, your controlling ownership. But those are things that you have to build traction um, to be able to negotiate. And generally, they're not good things to kind of write into the DNA of your company from day one because they'll really inhibit your ability to fundraise. Um, so the general advice we give is that if you want to figure out ways to actually maintain your company ownership, the best ways to do it is to do a really good job executing and to be capital efficient so you can raise less, sell less of your company, or negotiate uh, different ways to maintain that control. And that's probably a good one to end on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you all. Uh, like I said, this was one of the more uh, heavily RSVP2 events that we've held, but I hope this was useful for everybody. Um, and obviously there's this, you know, more questions come out when you provide more clarity. Um, but thank you so much for your detailed questions, your attention, just your attendance in the, in the hundreds, which was really cool to see. Um, we will follow up. We do have a log of all these questions as well. Um, so we will probably turn it into some follow on things. We're also doing more and more programming like this. So keep an eye out in your inbox. Uh, ourselves know a bunch about this stuff. We're also bringing in partners to, to augment our knowledge on anything from filing your taxes, there's a tax event next week, um, to accelerators, to things all over the place. So uh, if this feels like a, a dip into a much bigger lake, it probably is, uh, but stick with us and we will continue to explain this stuff and hopefully give you guys that extra leverage you need, um, a little bit more strategy and kind of building out your company. Check out what we have, gus.com. You probably all have accounts already, although I know a couple people from different communities have come here and this, this event has been shared through some of our partners and people we like in the space. So if you don't have a Gust account yet, it's free. We have all these tools, equity, the equity management stuff I played around with today is available at equity.gust.com and your free Gust account can give you access to things like the funding survey, which I put in the chat and all sorts of other things that can just help you along on your journey. Um, and yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Um, keep an eye on your inbox for future stuff and the follow-up content from this. Uh, if you're waiting for the recording, that will come automatically within two hours in an ugly email from GoToWebinar. I'm sorry, it's gross looking, but it will contain a link for it. Someday we will migrate to a platform that is probably slightly less ugly. Um, but thanks, everybody. Pete, thank you for championing quite a Q&A, uh, which is still intimidating to look at. And have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thanks, all.